Hi everybody, welcome to a special episode of Firefighters and Fire Trucks Getting Ice Cream. Today we will be cruising in a 1973 American La France up to Pioneer Town where my crew was trapped in a garage during the Sawtooth Fire, which burned over 60,000 acres, destroyed over 50 homes, injured multiple firefighters and civilians, and fatally burned one of the residents. I specifically chose this engine because it was very similar to the rig we were staffing during the burnover. It is a Century 1000 series ALF with a 671 turbo motor, a 1250 gallon per minute pump, and a 500 gallon water tank. She originally retired from Rockport, Tennessee, but was relabeled Willie Creek due to some sentimental value from the owner. Stay tuned as we return to Sawtooth for the 13 year anniversary of the entrapment of my crew. Hi everybody, welcome back to another episode of Firefighters and Fire Trucks Getting Ice Cream. I'm Jesse Quinalti and today we're hanging out with John Price. Uh, John is a, a state advocate from the Oven Goes Home program and uh, for a couple of years he had me roped in before I got really busy and uh, just a great program. And uh, this is kind of a special episode. We're actually up here in uh, Yucca Valley. We're heading up to Pioneer Town, which is where uh, I originally got burned over on a fire, on a wildlife fire, and got trapped in a garage with my crew. So that's the, the catalyst for Red Helmet training and uh, the reason why all of this exists today. So we're hanging out with John. It's obviously warm, he's drinking water, so. Uh, but we're heading up to the uh, heading up to Pioneer Town. How you doing, John? Doing good, man. Nice to be here with you on the anniversary of your uh, extended life period. <laughs> yes. And uh, you know, it was uh, I've been out here once before with you, and I, I think I mentioned being a city guy and having to go in the I zones once in a while. I studied a lot of bad incidents to try to prevent one. And right when I thought I kind of was getting a handle on fuel topography and whatnot, we come out to the desert and it's a burn over in the desert. <laughs> yeah. Totally reset uh, what I thought was uh, burnable. Well, that's why I always refer to that uh, weather topography and fuels as WTF. Because <laughs> it, it'll get you for sure. Let me get through the gears. Get that. It might be a good change. Oh, there it is. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting coming up here for the 13 year anniversary. And uh, we were talking about it earlier. Yesterday was my daughter's fourth birthday. And uh, amazingly, and luckily, I'm still here to see her grow up and, and do that. But uh, shortly after the sawtooth fire, uh, I was taking the Master Instructor Series learning how to become a better instructor as a training officer, and I run into you. And uh, that kind of formed my brain and changed the way I thought about training. And then you pushed up a whole nother level being part of the Everyone Goes Home program through the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. So how did you get started in that? Well, uh, early in my career, I uh, was tr in a bank fire that collapsed about the time of uh, Hackensack fire. Okay. And uh, the first edition of NFPA 1500 came out. It was mainly equipment, and then Bruno City became the technical chair. And the 92 version had be fire human behavior factors in it, and that really kind of got me to notice how certain policies can help enhance fire ground understanding. There was 14,000 comments alone on that edition of 1500 because back then in 92 guys weren't really willing to be told how to run their fires right a lot of good stuff uh we we both got to meet alan and spend time with him and he's 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 missed virtually every day in the fire service community so anyway uh that kind of came and 1500 still was out there but it wasn't as uh in demand so I'm at the National Fire Academy for a class. It was called uh, Advanced Safety Operations. And we had to leave on a Friday morning to make room for people coming in. And it turned out it was the 
uh, Memorial Weekend. So the widows and orphans were coming in with that 100 yard stare as we're leaving a safety class. It was really poignant. And one of the guys in there kind of recruited me to go into Everyone Goes Home. And uh, so I've been, you know, very fortunate to work with the guys that started it, Ron Sarnicky and uh, Vic Stagnero and some other guys. Many of those guys knew people that passed away on a call or were on a call where they did. And, uh, you talk about the affected domain, how that got you teaching. It tends to have a much deeper resonance when it's you. Right. Uh, you can hear about the V-ship or whoever having one, but my hat goes off to some of the young guys that we're teaching that look on it as if it is them right now. We're instead of having to wait for that incident. So anyway, uh, they, they created this 60 Fire Butter Life Safety Initiatives. And a lot of it's like admin or higher level, sprinklers, uh, radio uh, equipment. Right. But the technology and the yeah. Rules, yeah. The operational side, what I like, I have an acronym CARE, I think it's the first four initiatives for culture, accountability, risk management, and uh, empowerment. And so, thankfully, since I've retired six years ago, it's virtually in every department you teach, right? The young guys have the ability to say, hey, what's up? Versus just shut up and do what I told you. Multiple eyes on the subject. And the risk management paradigm that Brucini really got inculcated in the 1500 is now pretty much the way incidents are run. If there's not a savable life, the risk factor is not cranked up to you have to risk your life on every single call. Well, and I think that sometimes everyone goes home can get a bad rap, and it's not that they don't want you to be an aggressive firefighter. That's not it, or we're not going to go in that building at all. It, it's, it's about how to literally use that term calculated risk and how to actually apply it. I always said when I was a state advocate for the Everyone Goes Home program, is it's great to talk about that, but everyone doesn't go home until it hits home. Until you have, like we talked about, one of those incidents that really changes the culture of your fire department or you personally, I don't think you can really grasp that whole concept of, hey, I didn't change the way I'm doing business. Yeah. And uh, I know as a younger firefighter, I've been in some fires and I did some really stupid stuff. And uh, as you grow through the chain of command, your goggles change to, well, how much risk am I really willing to take? You know. And it's not that we're not doing what's right by the customer. Right. It's it's about what's right for uh, for everybody. Right. My crew's wives and children. Uh, I answered. I felt like a different switch kick on when you promote. Well, like you said, the bank fire that you guys were in. It was what time in the morning? It was only about eleven at night on Catella, okay. which is a well-traveled street. So I thought. There's no way this is a working bank fire. Right. I had a very limited, I only had five years on the job. Right. And uh, it took like two and a half bottles just to put out enough fire to go inside. And you can see some stuff that had been structurally way compromised. So we bottom line is we shouldn't have been there. Uh, yeah, 11 o'clock at night, we have to force our way in. You know, you know the bank is closed. What are we really doing, you know? Well, you know, it, started, it made me think because I had to drive down Coachella at the two stations I worked at at that time. That parking lot sat vacant for seven or eight years. A tree actually grew up in the parking lot. Right. And, uh, you know, you mentioned slap savers in some of your training. And, uh, you know, the wildland fire behavior prediction guys, I totally tip my hat to. I became a slap prediction specialist. I can tell you pretty much within two minutes of being on scene if that building was going to be bulldozed. And if it was, I wasn't going to let my guys have all the fun they wanted right. if it was going to compromise their getting out of it. Um, but the neat thing about everyone goes home is not just, okay, now we're going to make sure everyone goes home. They would network with other people that have been doing it. Uh, 
you know, like I think in an earlier episode, Steve P was talking about you're going to see people that have already been doing what you're doing, I mean, a different way. So, uh, National Fall Firefighters was really good at networking, like the IFC Health Safety and Survival Section, the Near Miss Program, Billy Gold Cutters, Firefighter Close Calls, the Wildland Community. They, uh, they just wanted the word to get out how guys were getting killed. Finally now, uh, I think about 13 years into it, is, uh, actually it'd be more than that, because it was already up and running when you had your deal. Right, right. 14. But now, the, the, the firefighter fatality rate is legit going substantially down, in my opinion. Right. You don't see, you know, a lot of the fatalities that were maybe not directed at rescue any, uh, as much so, you know, now you still see those searching at the old basement fire in the roof falls in or something, or guys having heart attacks, but anyway, well, that's been a great. really good run, and getting to work with you, and, and, and now with the uh, uh, NMPA, the latest uh, instructor edition, and actually several of the updates, they have embedded into their document the 16 life safety initiatives. Well, and the, when they first came out with those 16 life safety initiatives from the Life Safety Summit, I remember that they were they were really pushing it out there, and um, I lost my train of thought. Actually, we're coming into Pioneer Town. That's why. Yeah. So, John, this is uh, this is the entrance to Pioneer Town. Um, it's, it was basically an old Western movie set built by Dale Evans and Roy Rogers, and. Uh, just really cool, all old wood buildings and stuff like that. But this is Pappy and Harriet's Pioneer Town Palace. Uh, when we arrived on scene of the fire, everybody was congregating here as the fire was you know, burning towards the little town here. Uh, but here we're going to pick up Scott Pylon. He was actually one of my crew members that was in the garage with me. Right I think on. you've met him before. Mm -hmm. Give him a little code light stuff here. <laughs> Scott. Buddy. What's up? <laughs> How are you doing? How are you? Good, good, be good. Does it look familiar? Uh, a little bit. Yeah, and we were in a 1980 American La France. Yeah. So it looks, it looks pretty similar. This That's is the pretty closest good. I can find for you for hey, the ride. It'll do. <laughs> it'll do. Can we get some ice cream? Yeah, let's go, man. Uh, all right, John, take Scott and go get some ice cream. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, I guess we'll come back to Pappin here to have ice cream. Let's go to the site. Okay. And, uh, and yeah, check that let's go out. check it out. Yeah. Been a while since you've been up there? No. How long has it been since you've been to the site of the burn Uh I think it's been since this, well, maybe the year after. Okay. Uh, so maybe 12 years, 11, yeah. 12 years. Yeah. Been a long time. Well, I'm glad we're still here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Me and John were just talking about it. My my daughter's four year old birthday is the day before, and uh, this year you just got married. I just got married a few days ago. That's crazy. So yeah, um, it's, uh, it's amazing how things work out. It really is. But it's definitely surreal driving back through here, yeah. seeing uh, seeing the regrowth and how how much brush there is again and annual grasses again. And, yeah. But, it's a town again. Right. Yeah, you remember the fire came all the way through here. This this paved road, they basically held it on this paved road. Right. This guy's actually pulling over from my bubble gum. See that? <laughs> <laughs> um, they held this paved road uh, right here and kept it from Main Street and all the old Pioneer Town. But yeah, I remember some of the aerial photos that showed everything over here was black. Yeah. It was all... Still green, and a, and a ton of these houses ended up burning down. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it was. It was quite a bit of structures that caught fire, including the one we were protecting. Including the one that we were in. Yeah, the one <laughs> we were in. Yeah. So we'll cruise down here. Um, now, at the time of the of that fire. How long had you been in the fire service? Just a couple years. 
uh, had done some volunteer stuff before that and finished my fire academy and got hired with 29 Palms Fire. Right. So it had only been a couple years before this big fire happened. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it doesn't matter if you'd only been on the job for a couple of years. I, I think I was 14 or 15 years in at that point and uh, we're all susceptible to it. Yep. Um, this is, uh, John, this is the volunteer fire station where we originally staged uh -huh. to get our assignment uh, to go do structure defense. And then this is also where we came back to after we retreated, after the garage had caught fire, we, we barely escaped out of there. Um, so this is in those, in the training presentation, this is actually where we retreated back to. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when we came back here, you couldn't see anything around you because there was so much smoke. Right. And we could hear all the propane tanks to these, these homes just venting off. Well, and, and we get here, and there's a bunch of engines here, and the ambulances, the ambulances and are here, yeah. firefighters and, and civilians were all being treated for smoke inhalation and burns. Burns, and, yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so even with all the clearance the LPG tanks had, it was so hot that it still got them uh, releasing their uh, deal, huh? Yep. Yeah, they were, they, were, they were going off all over the place. Wow. Pretty amazing. I think some of them had vegetation underneath that was on fire too. So uh, yeah, it's just pretty amazing that that fire came out of this rocky area. You would never expect the, that fire to do what it did. Uh, and then here we are, 13 years later. You know. So how how has it changed your your mindset, you're, you just got promoted to lieutenant a while ago? Yeah, about four years ago. Okay. So how has that changed your mindset as far as what you do nowadays? Uh, safety is is priority number one. Every day we come on shift, it's safety, it's PPE. Are we doing things in a safe manner? Right. Uh, our department preaches safety on a regular basis every day. We do something called a safety check-in. So we just have a brief check-in. Hey, are we in the right mindset to, to start our shift every day? Um, we do that at crew meeting. And uh, yeah, I think every every response that we go on, it, it's always playing in my mind. Hey, are we doing things the right way? Are we doing things with, you know, in a safe way? Right. Uh, I mean, our goal every day coming to work is, yeah, we go and be aggressive with our responses, but also everybody goes home. So it's a, it's a big deal big culture that we preach. Well, and it's pretty amazing because I always say that this fire is the catalyst yeah. to Red Helmet training. Yeah. I mean, yeah. to having a training center with four classrooms yeah. and now yeah. going all over the country to yeah. teach, but it took an event like this to really shake me up and go, how are we training and why right. are we training? And, right. um, and it really just it just made a huge difference in, yeah. in my fire service career yeah. for sure. Yeah. I don't take PPE lightly after our fire. Yeah, I was mentioning uh, a little bit ago uh, off camera that you know uh, I got burned in this fire when we came back down, and if, if it wouldn't have been for my PPE that I was wearing at the time, it could have been a lot worse. I mean, I had tar drips, tar drippings on my my mask and my my goggles. I had burns through my coat on my sleeve, probably right. because I wasn't wearing a long sleeve cotton shirt. Still pretty crazy. You remember like there was that two story house up here that afterwards all that was left was like that spiral staircase. That's it. Like that's it. I, I think gone. it was this house right here. Yeah. Matter of fact. Yeah, it was like right over here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the only thing was the metal was the metal yeah, circular spiral, metal spiral staircase. Spiral staircase yeah. and all wow. the rest of the house Everything was else was on fire onto the ground. So this is this is Paloma right here, and yep. then we're gonna get on Lariat Trail where we were protecting. Do you, do you our remember uh, what time of day it was? It was about this time? It, it was it was uh, probably about that two thirty three o'clock time frame when the burnover occurred. I mean, we we probably got here around one ish. Was that the house you're telling me the guy laid in his bathtub and thought he was gonna die? I, I think that might have been the one here, and then they were the ones that took the pictures from across the street. Yep. So. 
Man, I can't. Did I back through that gate when we were originally here? On the I don't know if that gate was here. <laughs> I don't think that I don't gate think was here. I don't think we're going to be able to back in there, dude. Pull up here. I was telling John, I said, don't pull that one, that's the emergency shutdown. <laughs> <laughs>